So that's topic number one. So use jargon as sparingly as possible. And if you have to explain a simple concept using a whole bunch of jargon, I'm sorry, but you're a crappy teacher. <laughs> I'm just going to outright say it. If you're teaching more advanced students, you can obviously use a certain amount of jargon and there are situations where it's necessary. Tip number two. So um, when you're teaching beginners, I recommend two different approaches. If you can, try to teach the, uh, try to have a simple code example which demonstrates in code the concept you're talking about. Now, the thing about that is it's not always easy. It's not always possible to have a code example which can A, be under easily understood by a beginner, and B, sort of accurately describe the uh, situation. So what's an example? RxJava would be a great example. Coroutines, which I'll talk about a little bit later on, is another good example. Sometimes it's just not easy to find a, a code example which doesn't look like magic. Like a, Coroutines is a great example there. So what can you do instead of relying on code examples uh, when you're teaching people who probably aren't going to understand what they mean? Uh, the next best thing you can do is to think of the simplest real-life example you can think of, or metaphor, which still communicates the key points of the concept you are trying to teach. So once again, to explain this particular uh, tip here, uh, I just want to mention a, an article I wrote. So this article is called Programming Fundamentals, Part 5, Separation of Concerns. So in this article, I endeavored to explain uh, essentially what software architecture is without relying on any particular pattern. So I do talk briefly about model view presenter, model view view model, and all these sorts of things, but I don't go into any detail. And I try to actually explain what separation of concerns is and why that is essentially the fundamental principle of software architecture. So that sounds kind of complicated because imagine I'm trying to explain this to someone who hasn't really written uh, anything beyond like a, a God activity and I have to explain to them, okay, so if you have code that talks to a database, you put that in this class and if you have code which handles events and stuff like that, you put that into your presenter and then if you want to store data and I kind of go into that stuff. Instead of doing that in this article, I introduced the topic of software architecture using sidewalks. And all I did is I showed a big picture of a really ugly, cracked sidewalk here that's continuous. And then I showed an example of a sidewalk, which is separated into different squares. This is separation of concerns. Why is separation of concerns useful? Why is it useful to divide sidewalks into individual squares? Well, if one of the squares breaks, you can easily just replace that square. You can actually build these squares, the sidewalk, each part of it, in isolation of the other parts of it. And uh, that's about where that analogy starts to break down. But already what we've done is we've pointed out there is practical benefit to separating the different parts of a sidewalk it turns out that there's practical benefit to separating your architecture into different files, different functions. And from there, I go on to describe the different kinds of separations. So we have separation in graphical user interface applications. So I talk a little bit about the patterns. And then we look at separation of functions. So this is, for example, using helper functions. Instead of having one giant function you basically use helper functions to divide this function into different individually testable parts. And then we even get into uh, separation of, so the separation of things is like object-oriented separation. And then we even have separation of packages and separation of modules. So again, the finer details of that are not necessarily what I'm trying to get at here.
But what I've tried to do is I tried to think of the simplest example I could think of that is mundane in nature, is easily relatable to most people. I, I think most people have seen a sidewalk before. Uh, if you're a nerd like me and you're borderline autistic, then maybe you've also wondered why they are separated into individual squares. And uh, yeah, that just turned out to be the best analogy I could think of. So yeah, uh, the point, again, just for tip number two, uh, when you're teaching concepts to beginners, you want to try and p think of an example which is easily relatable to pretty much anyone, still has something to do with the concept you are teaching, and uh, go from there. Start there, and then you can become more detailed from that point. So that's basically uh, tip number two. Also, um, so generally speaking, here's kind of, to, to summarize tip number two, if you can, try to use a simple code example um, if you're dealing with people who understand the basics of code, because that's the closest thing to the source of truth. If you're dealing with people who might be completely new to whatever topic you're explaining, and the topic might be quite general and vague, that's when I strongly suggest use a visual example or a metaphor, for example, like sidewalks. And uh, that's just going to make it easier. More people are going to understand what you're talking about. And ultimately, that's the goal of being a teacher, I think, is to have your students understand what you mean. It's not to show how smart you are and how many big words you memorize.